I encourage everyone to take a moment and breathe and take a tea cheers with a Jiri tea. A Jiri tea recognizes the beauty in shared stories and shared opportunities. Ajiri sources award-winning tea from Kenya, employs women in the region to handcraft the labels, and sends 100% of the profits back to the region to support orphan education. Save 10% on your order of Kenyan teas and coffee with the code BEAUTIFULLYHUMAN at ajiritea.com. A-J-I-R-I-T.com. Tea mugs up! Hello, and welcome to the Beautifully Human Podcast. I'm Nick Sheesby. In this podcast, I speak with beautiful humans from all around the world, sharing with you their incredible stories, revealing the power in every human story to spread love and humanity to a world that is in desperate need of it, to show that we can all connect in beautiful ways, no matter where we come from or what we look like. What you will find out is that we are all beautifully human. Let's all be beautifully human. Hello and welcome to the Beautifully Human podcast. Thank you for tuning in wherever you are in this beautiful world. Uh, today I am hanging out with Catherine Klimatas and it's a it's a really cool conversation. Uh, she has this, this really powerful message about uh, using the abilities that you have, uh, what you were given, uh, to just go and be and do and live life uh, to the fullest, really. Um, Catherine has brittle bone syndrome, so um, it's a a really eye-opening and informative conversation um, that I I think we can all learn from. I I know we can all learn from it, so uh, I will let her tell you more about this. But uh, if you enjoy this podcast, follow us on Instagram at The Beautifully Human Podcast. Follow on Spotify and rate us on there. Uh, Rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts so we can get these conversations out to more people. And as always, enjoy this beautiful conversation. I love to start these off with a very broad and open-ended question and let you take it and run with it and just kind of see where our conversation leads. And I will say, tell me the story of your life. That is broad and open-ended. The story of my life. Well, um, I was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, technically. we moved to New Orleans when I was like eight months old. So in theory, I'm from the North, but I don't ever like to really say that because yeah. I've lived in New Orleans since I was eight months old. And if you know anything about the South, you don't want to necessarily be from the North. So, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I've lived in New Orleans basically my entire life. Um, I am an artist and a graphic designer. I've been painting, since I was about five years old, um, I sold my first painting when I was 10. And I have a genetic bone disease called osteogenesis imperfecta, which basically means that I break bones really easily and they grow abnormally. So I'm um, like two foot seven. Uh, and uh, I use an electric wheelchair for mobility. I got my first electric wheelchair when I was two. Um, I usually have an aide with me. Um, you know, I can't do a lot of normal daily activities by myself, like going to the bathroom or getting food or cooking or, you know, anything like that. Um, so people, one of the questions they get asked the most is how many bones have you broken? And Mm. the answer I like to shock people with, because it always gets that really great shock reaction um is i stopped counting around 500 when i was 10 Mm, so and i'm 33 now um so yeah a lot is the easy answer (laughs) (laughs) um and yeah i mean people also ask me does it hurt and it does i mean it hurts like you know i don't know if you've ever broken a bone but it it hurts um and but it's something that i've lived with my entire life so it's like my normal you know so it's um yeah it hurts but i have learned to deal with it you know for the last 33 years 
So, um, yeah, I got into art when I was about five. My mom was constantly trying to find things for me to do because I always went to a mainstream school, you know, because um, here in New Orleans, in general, a special ed school is usually catered to people with mental disabilities. Mm. And that's not me. Yeah. Right. So um, I, I didn't fit there. You know, that wasn't going to be beneficial to me at all. And so um, my parents pushed to keep me, you know, in a mainstream school with able bodied kids and regular classes. But the problem with that was that, you know, yeah, I made friends, but then I couldn't go out and do like soccer and baseball and dodgeball sure. and, you know, all the things they did. And so um, my mom was constantly trying to find things for me to do. And one day she gave me a watercolor set and it was, you know, one of those cheap crappy, you know, cakey watercolor sets <laughs> that you would give a five-year-old. Right. Yeah. And I loved it. And I blew through it and all the computer paper in the house in like three days. And, um, it turned out, you know, my parents realized that not only did I love it, I was actually pretty good at it, even for a five-year-old. Hmm. And so, um, from there, they got me into a bunch of summer camps and art classes in school, of course, um, and then some other private art classes. And I started learning all different types of media. Um, by the time I was a teenager, I had gotten to do, you know, acrylic and oil and drawing and um, some printmaking and glass blowing and sculpture and all of this stuff. And it's funny because I ended up going back to watercolor, which is where I started. Mm -hmm. um, and that's uh, that's just where I've landed today. But um, my parents were veterinarians. My mom is still practicing. Hmm. Um, and so I would go to work with them on the weekends because, you know, I mean, they didn't have anything else for me to do. Right. So I was stuck going to the office on the weekends and um, I would sit in the waiting room or in one of the treatment areas and paint people's dogs while oh, they waited. Yeah. And so, um, and I mean, I was just doing it for fun because I was bored, yeah. you know, but then, but then they started giving me money to do it. You know, like the client would come in and say, here, I'll give you 20 bucks if you paint my dog. And for a 12 year old, yeah, that's pretty cool. Right. That's a fortune. <laughs> exactly. Especially in what, 19, uh, 99 yeah, or yeah. something, you know, or 2000, you know, that's, a lot of money right yeah. and um and so i uh i started doing that and then um pet portraits actually is something i still do a lot of today cool. um obviously they have evolved a little bit since i was 12 <laughs> um but yeah but i started doing that and i started realizing that oh you know this could actually be my career because I'm 12 and I'm making money doing this. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's essentially, um, I did, I had, like I said, I had lots of private classes through high school and then I went into college, um, thinking that, um, I was going to major in fine art. Mm. However, I quickly realized that the amount of painting I would have to put out to, uh, financially sustain myself hmm. was it was physically not going to happen like sure. there's just no way right so i the the classes you take your freshman year for any art major are basically the same so i was able to switch my major from uh fine art to graphic design hmm. and so nice. i ended up graduating graphic design yeah and so um i do a lot of logo design and branding and uh things like that now too so it's, you know, my work is kind of half and half right now. I do a lot of painting, but I also do a lot of graphic design and I own my own business. I open my own business right out of college. And, um, yeah, that's my that's life so cool. story. That's yeah. so cool. Like what, I guess like for me, for me to break a bone, it, it, it takes a good amount of pressure mm -hmm. it takes something pretty mm -hmm. drastic from like for myself to break a bone. Right. Like what? What would it take to break a bone for you? Oh, if I sneeze in the wrong position, I break a rib. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, no, it doesn't take okay. much. It doesn't take much. Yeah. Um, I mean, 
it takes more than it used to. So there's, um, I don't know if you watch the show. There's a show called The Resident. Mm. I don't know if you've ever heard of the no. show. But anyway, it's, it's on one of the major networks. But the episode last week, and this made a lot of people on the OI community really mad. Um, but the episode last week was about a kid with OI. And um, the the show said, well, this kid is one of the lucky ones because he's gone into remission. Mm. Which, I mean, is a bunch of baloney. They don't go into remission. Yeah. Um, what happens is when you hit puberty, the hormones that you know your body has developed helps your bones not to break as often. Mm. It helps them get a little bit stronger, at least temporarily until you know you go into like menopause, sure. you know, until you get older. Um, and so it's not remission. <laughs> it's just it's just the rate of breakage is a little, you know, a little slower. Sure. Um, you know, I, you know, when I was really young, before I hit puberty, I had, I would break long bones often. Mm. So long bones, meaning my arms, my legs, um, you know, bigger bones. But now it, it usually takes something for me to do yeah. that. You know, like catching my toe on something and twisting my leg the wrong mm. way or, you know, hitting my you know, getting hit with something or, you know, whatever. But usually it takes some kind of outside force. Now. Okay. Um, but like ribs, you know, my, that's probably what I break the most often. And that's usually coughing, sneezing, wow. moving wrong. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Damn. Yeah. All right. And yeah. so on the opposite side <laughs> of it, so when you have a break of a bone, what is the healing mm -hmm. time like? And what is that? How, like, is it? Is it different or is it longer? Yeah, it is different. No, it's it's actually shorter. Hmm. So, um, I mean, it's it's longer than it used to be before I hit puberty. But but see, what happens is I have less to heal. So, like, if you look at your X-ray, your bones are white, hmm. right? On an X-ray, yeah. like they look really really white. Mine are like a light gray. Okay. At best. Okay. So they're not as dense as your bones. Sure. So. When I break something, um, there's less bone there to heal. Therefore, it takes less time. I see. Okay. You know, I, like I can heal a rib in a week, mm. you know, um, and longer bones, you know, they take longer to heal generally because in general, those breaks are worse and, you know, they're, they're bigger breaks, but, um, but I mean, you know, a rib is not a huge deal yeah. for me. And, and also, I mean. I also know how to function with a broken rib sure. really well, yeah. you know? Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a kind of a trade off. So yeah, I do it more often, but it takes a lot less time. Okay. Yeah. I didn't, I, I, I'm, I'm constantly learning about, <laughs> about new, new disabilities because, uh, I work with uh, a company, a nonprofit called, uh, we carry Kevin. And my friend who uh -huh. started it has spinal muscular spinal muscular atrophy, and so um, uh -huh. he has these backpacks where um, anyone that has someone with limited mobility can put their friend or their family member in a backpack and then kind of like take them on a uh -huh. hike with them. And so that's awesome. We have I have a ton of interaction with families, and like I, I think that's been the most eye opening thing for me because with my privilege of having an able body, I haven't paid attention as much as I should have mm -hmm. to other, other non able bodied people. I mean, I paid attention to them, but I didn't know specifics about right. their, their, um, you know, their, whatever they have. So I guess, is there anything else like just kind of as an educational way for me to learn more like that I can, just just have knowledge of that you've learned in your 33 years um well i mean specifically about oi or just in general just in general i mean like yeah I, I know you kind of briefly touched on it but like caretakers and just like oi in general like i don't know i mean yeah 
just kind of because I, I, I imagine I, I'm kind of in this sphere of learning because I work with We Carry Kevin. So I kind of kind of meet people and hear more and more about these types of things. But um, just for anybody that's listening, that's kind of got any general questions or just kind of wants to know, like, you know, what what the a day in the life of or like, you know, just living with that. Yeah. Um, OI is tricky. So there's OIfoundation.org. You can always go and like learn a lot of the technical things from there. Um, and the more scientific explanations for, you know, why we are the way we are. Um, OI is tricky though, because there are a lot of different severities. Okay. So I'm one of the most severe. Um, I, they call my type type three, but it's basically the most severe without dying before you're two. Oh, wow. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, um, the type that is more severe than me, basically the baby's fetuses, whatever does the rib cage doesn't form. Mm. And so the, the organs can't form. Sure. I mean, that's, I mean, that's the short version. Yep. Um, however, on the flip side of that, there are people with type one and and type four a little bit, but type one especially that you wouldn't know they have a lie okay. because they can walk. Um, they have maybe broken a couple of bones, you know, right around puberty randomly. And that's the only reason they've been diagnosed. Sure. Um, one thing that's kind of interesting, uh, I mean, <laughs> I say interesting, but <laughs> a lot of, parents especially type ones especially the kids that don't necessarily get diagnosed in utero you know or right away a lot of parents get uh accused of child abuse oh, wow. because what happens is these kids show up at school with a broken wrist or a broken leg or whatever and they can't tell you how they did sure, it yeah because they don't know because yeah. it just happens Man. You know, and so and so what happens is, you know, obviously the school calls CPS and this whole investigation happens and um, it's it's really scary. Yeah. Um, I mean, I have there's a bunch of message boards and groups for people with OI on Facebook. And I mean, there are countless, yeah. countless stories about parents, you know, they're on there going, oh, my God, my child just got taken away from me. What do I do? How do I, how do I, um, how do I get them to run the genetic testing faster? You know, we just want our kid back. Wow. I mean, you know, it's just, it's really scary. Um, I, I have a child abuse story, which is actually, it's pretty funny. Um, I'll try to tell it quickly, but my, as I said, my parents are veterinarians. Mm. And so I would go to work with them on Saturdays and, you know, if you've ever been in a veterinary clinic, it's really busy and there's a lot going on and people are running back and forth and every once in a while a dog gets loose, you know, or a cat gets loose or whatever. And it's just, you know, it's hectic, right? Because there's a lot going on. And so it's not a good place for somebody who breaks bones to be in the way, right. right? So my parents had this set of cages in the back that was like three large cages stacked on top of each other. And they were situated such that you could see the surgical area, you could see this treatment area, and you could see down the hallway to the front, to the waiting room area from those cages. So that was my favorite place to mm -hmm. be. Like I would get in the middle one, which was about eye height, you know, on, on somebody normal, right? And, um, you know, sometimes I would have, my Barbies or my toys or my painting stuff or, you know, a random kitten, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Right. I would have, I would have stuff to do and, you know, they would give me my lunch and, you know, I was perfectly happy and perfectly safe. Yeah. Right. Um, one day a woman came in, I was probably about eight or so. A woman came in, not a client, like she was a walk-in. Her cat had gotten, it was deathly ill. I don't know if it had gotten hit by a car or had some other kind of drama. But anyway, my mom had put the cat in isolation, which was behind where mm. I was. 
So basically, in order to go to the cat, you had to walk by me in the cage. (laughs) Um, So this woman, I I think they ended up putting the cat to sleep. And mom brought the lady back, you know, to see the cat or whatever. And the woman looks at me, doesn't say a word, just looks at me, goes, does whatever with the cat and then leaves. Like an hour later, there are two cops in the office and they say, you know, we got a call, an anonymous call about a veterinarian keeping a child with brittle bone disease in a cage. Oh my God. And so there, so there are certain, um, there are certain characteristics that all people with OI have. Okay. So it's like the shape of our face, um, the shape of our chest. Um, we have the whites of our eyes are kind of blue. Mm. You know, our bones are bent. I mean, there are certain things that if you know what to look for, you can identify yeah. it. I mean, it's just, you know, if you're educated in it. So obviously this woman in some way was educated in OI. I have no idea yeah. how. Clearly not very well. <laughs> anyway, so I had to get out of the cage. It was this whole thing. Um, and, the, and uh, you know, the cops interviewed my mom. My dad happened to have left town that morning. So he wasn't there, but my, the cops interviewed my mom, the staff, the clients that were in the office. I mean, it was a whole thing. And they left. They left me and everything was fine. But they ended up doing home vi- a home visit, like to make sure that, you know, and they made sure they didn't show up when they said they would. They just showed up on, by surprise. Yeah. They interviewed my aide. Um, and it was this whole thing. And mom and her main staff member actually ended up figuring out who called it in Mm. because you know there were my dad had gone out of town so the people who were scheduled were people we knew right you know i mean it was not like and people who clearly would not call the cops on us right and this was the only lady you know that could have done it and mom called her and chewed her out and she's like look you know she was there because she was safe you know, like, and you know, he's like, well, she could put her arms through the bars and break them. I was eight years old. Yeah, yeah. Like, I, you know, I knew better by that. Right. You know, I didn't want to hurt. Right. So why would I was smart? Yeah. Why would I put my arms through the bars and break them? <laughs> right, right, right. You know, and my mom's point was like, did you even talk to her? Right. You know, did you even ask her how she was doing? Ask her if everything was okay? Yeah. You know, so. That's my child abuse story. Mm. It's a little different than most, yeah, yeah, but yeah. 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 Man, I until you said that, I did not even think about parents having that issue of of people thinking their children were being abused. Oh yeah. I had I not even crossed my mind. That's yeah. Oh yeah. Man. That's a major, major problem. Yeah, no, I mean, as the second you said it, I was like, yeah, that makes so much sense. Like a kid comes in and, you know, there's probably bruising because it's a break. And it's like, yeah, of course, like what else would you think if, if someone can't explain <laughs> why why this has happened? And maybe they don't know yet either, too, you know? Exactly. Oh, man. But yeah, I think I think one other thing that you that you pointed out early early on when you were telling your story too is that you know you went to went to not a special ed school, and I I don't know I I feel like some people just have that mentality that because you look different that nothing you know that something's going on up up in your brain as well as, right. as like because oh, your body doesn't look as, like you know like mine does that something's going on and i i don't know i've just it makes me sad when people think that because it's it's not the case you know yeah i um so the three most common ones for me is is that that i have some kind of mental issue um and and quite honestly some days i think i do um (laughs) i mean i think we all know more than a normal person (laughs) you're right um (laughs) um and so that's that's probably the most common uh, for some reason. Um, well, also, they think I'm a child, uh, sure. right, because I'm small. Yeah. So that's, and you know, like there was one night, this is one of my favorite stories. There was one night, my friend and I, um, I'm a big concert goer. Yeah. I love going to see live music. And we went to see Styx, the yeah. band, at um, a casino. And you know, at casino concerts, they finish at like 10 or 10 30, yeah. right? So we went out after to a restaurant, a really nice restaurant. Um, 
and you know ordered food whatever the the server comes up to the table and she looks at me now i am like we just went to a concert mm. you know i'm in like a strapless shirt makeup yeah. hair you know like the whole thing right um and she goes and would you like to order a shirley temple and i was like yeah if you had vodka to it <laughs> you know like i mean that lady that poor lady I felt kind of bad afterwards because she was like, oh, I mean, no, I'm so sorry. You know, and I think our drinks drinks ended up being free that nice. night. But, um, but yeah, she just she just assumed, yeah, yeah. you know, and I'm like, OK, who first of all, who lets their three year old go out <laughs> in you know, a strapless right. shirt and a full face of makeup, right? right. To, a, to a casino. Yeah. Also, I mean, we're still in a casino, yeah, yeah. but uh yeah it was so i get that a lot and then i also get like and and it's true i do have some hearing loss mm. but i'll have people like yell uh, at me as if i'm deaf yeah yeah. and i'm like okay wheelchair does not equate to yeah, deafness yeah. like i don't i don't understand how they jump to right. that but somehow somehow they do yeah the other thing i get a lot and this this drives me absolutely insane um I get the person, so I get two people, and I mean, I know this is stereotyping, but they're everywhere. Right. The first one is um, the nurse or the healthcare worker or the doctor or some somehow in the healthcare industry that says, oh, I'm a nurse, so I know all about what you go of through. Of course, yeah. Which is ridiculous right. because not very many people have heard of this disease especially at my severity and for a nurse it's a paragraph in a book right you yeah. know i mean unless they specialize in orthopedics it's a it's a paragraph in a book um and then i also get the people who say oh my cousin or my brother mm. or my aunt was in a wheelchair and so i know all about that i'm like no you yeah. don't <laughs> right no, you don't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so I get, I get those a lot, Ugh. and it's very annoying. Yeah, it's yeah. so just. I don't know. I think the more I speak with people, and the more I'm learning, and I, like I said, I, I wasn't good at it. I'm not perfect before now, and I, I don't think I ever will be. But like, I don't know. I, I just think it's, it's a very broad blanket statement, but especially like for you, is like treat me like I'm human. And if, if I can't hear you well enough, I'll ask you to speak up or like, exactly. I will, I will exactly. guide you down the road to make myself comfortable, but like, don't automatically come up to me and start screaming at me or all these other exactly. things. Like treat me like a human. And then if I can't hear you, I'll ask you, you know, or exactly. don't, don't treat me like I won't understand you and speak slower and be like, hi, how are you right. it's like no, i'm fine you asshole like just speak to me <laughs> it, it takes a lot to not say that oh, sometimes sure. because believe me i'm like oh my god you know people it just it amazes me like you know i have people say things like slow down you'll get a speeding ticket or mm. um what's the other one? Oh, do you have a license to drive that thing oh. that one's really common yeah, yeah. Um, I have people who want to pet my head. Oh. I'm like, Why? no, don't touch me. Yeah. Like, I don't want to. Would you touch her right. over there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't touch yeah, me. Why are you petting like, people? Yeah, Ugh. it's weird. Yeah. I don't know. That's it's weird. weird. Ugh. That's yeah. I'm not a dog. Y yeah, I think that's even. I mean, I live with five, but I am not a dog. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. We all love dogs, but don't don't pet do. me like a dog. We Good do. Lord. Exactly. Um, so another question I have, and it's it's because I was thinking about the We Carry Kevin pack too. So like the pack, it would ba basically, not even basically, you just like sit in it and it's like a harness and then someone carries you. Would that be harmful for you? Yeah, that would be hard for okay. me. Um, we did do that when I was smaller, yeah. when I was like 10. We went bear boating in the Bahamas. Oh, nice. And, oh, you know, when you live on a boat, you can't bring a wheelchair. Right. Um, not an electric wheelchair, for sure. Um, and that was a really fun trip. But again, it was when I was smaller and lighter. Sure. Um, and it was easier to put me in something like that. 
now like the biggest problem would be that I can't it's hard for me to get stay in a sitting position for sure. a really long time um so I actually lay down the paint that's something that oh, okay. um surprises people but I um also the pressure on my chest mm. would be really yeah, hard yeah. you know like we'd have to figure out a way to not put any pressure on my sternum okay because that that would not be a good right. thing yeah yeah and like yeah. just the constant like bouncing and like the, yeah the, yeah that would i cannot yeah i mean i get sore when i do that in my wheelchair sure you know like um you know our lovely new orleans streets <laughs> sure, <yeah. laughs> you know yeah. um yeah that that's a little that's hard on my back um, yeah and it's hard on my yeah, neck yeah. you know so yeah that's not really something i personally would be very interested in also i mean for me when i'm in my chair i'm in control of where i'm going right. and i like that. yeah of course <laughs> no you know um so i i just i don't really have an interest in not sure being in control yeah of where no, i'm I, going yeah i don't yeah, you know I don't, I don't blame you um so as yeah. far as like beyond even that like is traveling something that's really like too much or too tough for you yeah um it's not too much but it's a challenge yeah. um especially flying yeah. driving is no big deal i mean i i try to drive wherever yeah. we can just because it's you know i can take all the things i need i don't have to worry about the airline damaging the wheelchair yes. which is usually the biggest yeah. concern yep, yep. um because we've had it happen so many times and these wheelchairs i mean the one i'm sitting in right now is a seventy-eight thousand dollar piece of equipment Jesus. you know yeah. and like you don't go to walmart and find replacement parts. right right um you know actually this chair is from sweden yeah. so uh i can't you know we do have outlets in the united states but in more nine times out of ten when a new part is needed it has to be shipped overseas yeah, yeah. You know, and so it's a problem. Right. Um, so like we this not this chair, but one of my older ones, um, we flew to Hawaii one time when I was about 10, 10 or 11, something like that. And when we landed, they dropped the chair out of the plane, like from the belly of the plane to the ground, oh. because they decided to try to hand a 200 pound wheelchair down to one guy. And I mean, of course, he dropped yeah, of it. Course. It's 200 pounds, yeah. you know, and, um, you know, so for a week, we, you know, we managed to, I mean, we're in Hawaii, right? On vacation. Um, we, we managed to literally duct tape it back together. <laughs> I mean, quite literally the plane mechanics came up and we managed to splice wires and duct tape them, electrical tape them back together, bend wheels back without breaking them and just hope for the best for a week. Yeah. And then we had to sue the airlines for the wheelchair. And it was, I mean, it was this 10 month process. Wow. I mean, it was ridiculous. Yeah. It was ridiculous. That was the worst time. But I mean, we've had them, you know, we've had them damage the seating. We've had them break headlights off. We've had them bend wheels. I mean, you know, more minor problems, but still problems. Right. You know? Yeah. So yeah. it's just more of an annoyance to even, even get up there. I know I, the more I hear stories of, of any kind of like, you know, electric to just like the regular wheelchair, yeah. like every, I, I just don't understand how like people are so just like, like, it's not just like a piece yeah. of luggage. It's, it's something that is very necessary. Right. And a lot of times they're and I custom put, made too, right? They are. They're all, I mean, mine are all custom yeah. made. Um, and I put directions on the wheelchair, like on how to use it, like how to drive it, how to move it, how to move it without having to drive it, you know, where you can put it in a neutral mode and just push it, um, what you should do with it when it gets into the plane. Like we put all, how much it weighs, how much it costs. Yeah. I mean, we put all of this on the wheelchair so that, when we get to our destination and something's wrong, yeah. we can say, look, it was all right here. Right. All they had to do is read. Yeah. yeah. You know? Oh, so, yeah. so annoying. 
All right. It is. Oh man. Okay. So what, so your art, so you said, what, what do you typically do with your art? Like what's, what's your specialties? So I paint predominantly animals. Okay. Um, as I said, I started off at my parents' office, but, um, I mean, animals have always been a huge part yeah. of my life. You know, I, I, we've had pretty much every pet you could possibly imagine, um, with my parents being veterinarians. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> And honestly, I mean, I'm one of those people that just likes animals more than most Same. people. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. know? Um, yeah. So I do um, I do a lot of wild animals. I do a lot of Louisiana birds. Cool. I just had an exhibit. I had my first museum exhibit Amazing. at the end of last year. Yeah, it was super exciting. Um, it was a small museum in like right outside of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Yeah. Um, but it went really well. Uh, I got some really good press out of it and it was all Louisiana birds. So that was, that was really fun. Um, but yeah, I, I, so what I've done is, so I do pet portraits and that's a major part, yeah. like a huge yeah. chunk of what I do, especially, especially at like Christmas. <laughs> of course. Oh my God. It gets <laughs> like out of control. Yeah. Um, but, um, I also do, like if I, let's just say I paint a painting of a heron, you know, or some kind of bird. Um, I try to sell my paintings on products. So like I'll do a painting and then I'll say, oh, that'll look really good on a mug uh, or that'll sure. look really good on a blanket or that'll look good on an ornament. And so I have an Etsy store oh, nice. that I have all of my products available. Amazing. In. Yeah. Um, so that's good because it... It's good for me because I only do the painting once and then I make money on it, right? Yeah, on these products. Yeah, yeah. But it's good for other people because not everybody can afford to buy an original sure. painting. I mean, they take time, right? So I have to charge for them. And I have clients to do. You know, I have collectors yeah. that do buy my work as originals. But, um, you know, it's more likely that somebody can afford a $35 blanket right. rather than a $400 sure, painting. Yeah. You know, um, so it allows my art to be in their homes in a different right. way, a less expensive way. So, yeah, it works out for everybody. That's so cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's fun. All right. Tough question because we're talking oh, animals. My. If you had to choose, <laughs> what would your favorite oh. animal be? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I know. It's so tough. I mean, I mean, I love my dogs. Yeah. You know, I live with five dogs and, um, We've always had dogs. Uh, we got my first dog when I was two. Oh, yeah. yeah, so we've always had dogs. And I'm, you know, uh, they're all so different from one another. Yeah. They all have such um, <laughs> solid personalities yeah. um, and quirks, you know. Um, so I, you know, I love dogs. But I mean, if I had to choose like a wild animal, um, I don't know. I don't know if I could choose yeah. one. Um, I really, as far as painting, I really love painting birds. Yeah. And I think part of that is is because they're so pretty, yes. right? And there's so many different colors. And um, But honestly, part of it is because I paint a lot of animals with fur. Mm. You know, I paint a lot of dogs and a lot of cats. And sometimes it is just nice to paint something without yeah, hair. Yeah, totally. Um, you know? Uh, it gives me a little bit of a break. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, like I said, the Louisiana birds have really, um, been fun yeah. to do. Birds are fascinating yeah. too. They're just so smart they are. and random. And they are. They're just crazy. And I love them. They are. We have a family of hawks that lives in our neighborhood Ooh. and they're, yeah, I know. And we have some small dogs <laughs> yeah. and we're always like, uh yeah yeah okay we need to keep an eye on <laughs> yeah, that for sure you know but yeah they're savage yeah. i mean it's nature so nature is savage it but, is yeah. i mean i understand it but yikes yeah you know yeah no i've yeah i i have friends who live in areas where there's there's really scary wild birds and they they have very small yeah. dogs so they have to be like very very careful as as they want yeah i mean we know people who that's how oh. like you know uh hawk or an eagle has come down and grabbed oh. them and if the dog had not been on a leash like oh. dog would be gone yeah. 
now. Ugh, that's how my yeah. yeah. Yeah, I know. Crazy. I, I asked that question knowing that that was a very tough answer. I mean, it's it's hard to it come up. Hard it's hard answer. to come up with like any kind of like what's your favorite, but I will tell you this. I will tell you this. When I was young, I before I decided that art was going to be my thing, you know, and art was going to be my career. I was obsessed with Free Willy. Ah, yeah. I mean, like completely <laughs> and totally obsessed with that movie one two and three mm -hmm. i mean like all of them and um i loved orca wills i mean like i i was i i probably still know everything about them and that just like they're just really beautiful yeah. animals you know and they just they move really beautifully and um you know people what bo what always bothered me about it is people always called them killer whales yeah. right and you know and they and they give them a really bad rap, but it's kind of like pit bulls. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like if you treat them with respect yeah. and, and you know how to deal with them, like you don't go around them when they're hungry and you don't like, you know, then they're actually pretty cool. Yeah. You know, they're, you know, they don't want to eat you all the time, right. you know? Yeah. Um, you know, and like I said, same with pit bulls. Like if you understand their prey drive and you understand yeah. like, don't tempt them with something small and fuzzy. Right. You know, you're good. Or beat them into right? being a terrible, you know, exactly. I mean, any, any, they're exactly. wild animals. So if they're pushed and pushed and pushed, they're going to be exactly. aggressive. That's their nature exactly. is to be aggressive. Exactly. So I know exactly. I, I feel that way when people, I see like big game hunters and they're like in these territories and they're like hunting these things, or you see someone and they're like, they got attacked by a, a lion and I'm like, what the hell were you yeah. doing near a lion? Yeah. Like, what do you expect? Exactly. You're in their territory. Exactly. Like, I don't, I, I don't agree. feel bad. Like if you're going out there, you, you should understand the, the, the risk that you're taking being around these wild animals. Exactly. Like, exactly. And I mean, it's little, th like I have a neighbor who I love. I mean, she's a great kid. She's like 13, but she came into my house the other day and, was uh, like purposely annoying one of my small dogs yeah. just because she was, you know, being 13. And it's fine. But she's like, do you think she'll bite me? I'm like, yeah, probably. Yeah. And I'm not going to tell her not to yeah. because you're annoying her. <laughs> right. And she's like, oh, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. yeah. I mean, I would bite you <laughs> right? if I were her. Yeah. You yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I'm with you. Um, all right. I have two more questions for you. Okay. I ask these to everybody and I just think they're they're fun questions. They're a little I wouldn't say challenging, but sometimes people think they are. But okay. the first question is what would you want the world to know about you, Catherine? Oh, I feel like we've already kind of talked about this. Um yeah. what would what would I want the world to know about me? Um, I think, uh, so there's this TV show that I, it may or may not still be going on, but it was called Little People, Big World. And it was about um, a family who the parents were little people and one of the kids was also little. And then two of the kids were not. Two of the kids were born normal, you know, quote unquote normal. And um, in the introduction of that show, the mom narrates narrates the introduction and she says something like i um i just want people to understand that it's not that we can't do it we just do it differently and that's not exactly how she says it but that's what she means yeah and um and i think that like that has always hit home for me you mm -hmm. know because it's not i mean there are things i can't do by myself but i can usually end up at the same goal you know, the yeah. same end as most people, Yeah. you know, if that makes sense. No, totally. And I, th yeah. I, I think that's, I just think that's a really powerful way to put it is like, it might not be the same, but like, I'm, uh, I'll get there in my own, right. my own way, you know? And exactly. I, I think, I, I, I think that's really powerful coming from you, but that's also just like a really powerful message to anyone yeah. in the world like we all have yeah. different abilities we have different minds we do things differently because we're human right 
Like exactly. If we all did the same thing in the same way at the same time, it'd be quite boring. Exactly. I mean, even as an artist, you know, you look at um, I, I got the incredible opportunity to hang out with a woman named Wendy Roderick, who was George Roderick's wife. And um, George Roderick is world renowned. He did the Blue Dog. I don't mm. I mean, I'm sure having lived in New Orleans, you know yep. about the Blue Dog. But um, anyway, I got to hang out with her for a day and learn about him he's he's passed away but um just even just learning about his process uh as an artist and seeing that like he and i could get to the same end you know we could we would get obviously our paintings would not look the same at all because we had very different styles but um you know we we would start a painting from a blank canvas and end up with a painting yeah. at the end you know but the process by which we both got there is it's it was really interesting to see the similarities and the differences yeah yeah you know and and i've always found that to be very interesting even we just went to this um immersive van gogh experience yesterday and it taught you a lot about his process and mm -hmm. and and same thing like it's really interesting to learn you know how he started and how he finished yeah you know um, and, and you can apply that to anything, yeah. you know, outside of art. Totally. Yeah. And while we're speaking on it, I didn't ask, what is your process of painting? Like, how do you, how long does it oh. take or what's, what's your typical, what, what's your style? Yeah. Um, so I, I call my style, it, it's, it's realism. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, it still looks like a painting. So it's yeah. not exactly photo realism, but it, it's, um, very intricate i use a very small brush in general i do paintings that are no larger than nine by 12. now i just broke that rule about two weeks ago and i did a 12 by 16 which i don't plan to do again for a while <laughs> but um <laughs> i um it's really hard for me physically to do something bigger sure. just because i can't reach right um i lay down to paint okay. so um it's easier for me to not have to hold my arm up and paint so when I lay on my side I can rest my arm on my body and then paint for yeah. longer periods of time um and that works for me and I had so one thing that's really interesting and you, everybody listening to this should try this one day whether you can draw or not it doesn't matter but I uh when you lay down the world looks very different than when you sit up and yeah. you don't realize it until you try to draw something laying down and then you try to draw the same thing sitting up. Um, so I did a, I did a talk for a group one day and I had them bring like a simple object, you know, like a, a vase or a, you know, a light bulb or whatever to the, to the talk. And then I had them put their head on the table and lay, you know, with their head to the side and draw the object that was in front of them. And then I had them put that piece of paper, flip it over, put it to the side and on a new piece of paper, sit up and draw the object again. Yeah. And it didn't matter whether they could draw or not. The point yeah. was how different the two drawings look from each other. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So when I was a teenager, I had a private art professor teaching me at a college level mm -hmm. and she actually would lay on the floor with me and look and see the world like I was seeing it and then teach me, okay, like this, I know this is what you think you're seeing, but that's not really what you're seeing. So you have to compensate this much for wow. your angle. Right. And so like learning that was invaluable. I mean, you know, because that, you know, when you, when, so before that, all of my drawings would be crooked, right? They would be, way crooked and whimsical but like whimsical is okay when you're a kid sure. unless you're purposely trying to be whimsical as as a professional yeah you know um and so there's a certain point where as a professional you've got to not do that yeah you know um un unless that's your style and you're purposely like you know how to not be but you're per you're doing it on purpose yeah you know there's a reason um, and so 
that was kind of the turning point when I went from hobby to career, sure. you know, or hobby to potential career. Yeah. Because that's when, you know, I actually learned how to draw. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, most of my paintings, they start with a really basic drawing and then I do paint. Okay. I mean, that's, yeah. yeah. I use a really small brush. Um, people ask me how I get so much detail in my paintings and it's literally a brush with like five hairs. Oh, so wow. yeah. And I go through them really fast because they wear out. So yeah. like that, my biggest purchase on black Friday this year was 20 brushes yeah. because they were on super sale. Perfect. I was so excited. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I love it. I know. <laughs> so good. All right. So my last question for you is if you had the ear of every single person in the whole world, what would you say to them? Um, the ear of every single person in the world, what would I say to them? I think I would tell them to just, I mean, this sounds like Nike, but just do it. Like, you know, <laughs> the thing, the thing that bothers me the most probably is when people um, have potential to do something and they just don't yeah. just because they don't feel like it or they're scared or they're lazy mm. or whatever it is. And it's frustrating to me because, you know, I look at people who have perfectly normal bodies, mm -hmm. you know, they don't have pain every day. They don't have to figure out how to live in a world that's not conducive to them. Um, and they, they just don't do anything. They mm -hmm. just sit inside, they play video games and they don't do anything Yeah. or they don't play video games, you know, whatever. Um, and that's really frustrating, you know, because I do a lot and mm -hmm. I do it with extra challenges, yeah. you know? Um, and so it, it annoys me. You know, we had a friend who was, in, I mean, she's, <laughs> for lots of reasons is no longer our friend, but um, perfect, like incredibly smart, brilliant. I mean, this woman was a, a stockbroker on Wall Street. Mm. I mean, incredibly smart. And she just, she just stopped, you know, she got in her head and she got overwhelmed and she wouldn't let anybody help her. And um, she, you know, she just quit being herself and she just shut out the world. And that was that. Yeah. You know, and that kind of thing is very frustrating yeah. to me. And it's very hard for me to watch. Um, cause I don't like, I don't like seeing somebody with so much potential sure. do nothing. Yeah. You know? Um, so yeah, just do it. Yeah. <laughs> try new things. Yeah. You know, that's the other thing is if you don't try new things, it's, you know, you're never going to get anywhere. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I don't, I don't, it, it does sound like Nike because that's always been their thing, but it's I, such a, it's, it's so brilliant, but it, it, but it's so brilliant. It's so, it, it speaks above and beyond everything to just like, if you got the ability, if you have the talent, if you have the drive, like go do what you want to do, like yeah. get out there and do it. And that's one thing that, um, me working with Kevin and the nonprofit has really taught me is like, I am so privileged to just stand up and, you know, just live my day to day life, you know, with, without AIDS or any of that. And it's like, so many people take that for granted. And, and like, I think about that a lot now where it's like, if I'm having a day where I, I don't want to get up and do something, I'm like, but I can do something. So let's, mm -hmm. let's go do something. Let's be active. Like also it's the one life we get. So why not get right. up there and, and do exactly. these things? And no matter who you are, or what ability you have, it's like this life can be really short and it's, you know, yeah. time speeding up as it is. So it's like, why not? Yeah. Just get out and go and do what you want to do. Live your life. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, people, and I mean, I, I do this too, you know, you worry about money and you worry about having enough money, right. To do the things you want to yeah. do. And, and I found like, if, if you work really hard and you do what you love, it, it works out eventually. Yeah. 
you know, and I'm not saying it works out immediately. You know, I mean, I've been, I've had my business for almost 11 years and well, actually I just passed 11 years. Um, nice. And I am finally at a point where I feel like I'm making an adequate amount of money, Yeah. you know? So, I mean, it's, it's taken time, but you know, like I'm actually at a point where I, I feel like I'm, I'm doing it, Yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, if you just keep at it, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, and I always say there's one good thing about living in a really greedy world. And that only means that we can always make more money. That's right. There's tons of it swirling around. People always want it. People will pay you to do things. So yeah. I, like I, I always encourage not to worry too much about money. I do understand you have to have money to do things, but if you have of money, go course. do things and then come back and work hard and make more money and then enjoy because if you and just go do things. simply yeah. make money and then you die, I don't yeah. think it's worth much. It's definitely not I worth agree. much. You know, like I agree. I had a, close call with death almost four years ago now and had i had one billion or 20 billion or whatever the richest person in the world if i was the richest person in the world the second i pass away that that does nothing more it doesn't for me. matter or if i had right. one penny in my pocket it doesn't matter either spectrum you're on you know so i always just say like go yeah go live your life enjoy it and do what you can yeah. with the time you're given and you know what what life has has given you the ability to do so yeah. i think it's a beautiful beautiful thing um last thing where can people find your art where can they they check you out and follow along with your journey yes so my website is the best place to go is k-a-k -K, which are my initials um art nola which is New Orleans, Louisiana, but so cacartnola.com. Um, and from there, I'm also on Facebook and I'm on Instagram as cacartnola. Um, I am technically on LinkedIn. I'm not <laughs> as good about updating yeah. it, but I am technically on LinkedIn. Um, and then I have an Etsy store, as I said, so you can get to all of that through my website. So, Perfect. So um, yeah, and I have a YouTube I do. I have a YouTube channel also, okay. but again, not as good about updating it. I, I try. Oh. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah. I will, I will link all of that to the show notes too. So people can come awesome. and find you and check out your, your fun yeah. artwork and just yeah. Yeah, follow along. With now, I will say I've never shipped to Norway, <laughs> Okay. but I can try. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll go look. Yeah. And I'll let you know. I can I, try. I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible it's possible i'm sure i'm sure and i'm just putting up things in my in my place so i, I have awesome. plenty of space I, I i only have like seven things up right now so i, I have oh, a lot of space for new exciting. new things yeah definitely well i thank you so much for your time and it's been really yeah. lovely chatting with you and getting to know you and I'm, I'm really happy we connected yeah this is this has been great awesome well i hope you have a beautiful rest of your day and thank you yeah. Thank you again. All right. See you. Thank you for listening to the Beautifully Human podcast. To hear more beautiful stories from beautiful humans, follow us on Spotify and rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. Follow us on Instagram at the Beautifully Human Podcast. Peace signs up.